This message was preached at the 2016 Naval's Convocation with the theme, Sound of Abundance of Rain, between the 26th and 29th October at the Missy Training and Retreat Center along Mararabanrido Road, Kaduna. For further inquiries on this and other messages, please contact Refuge Media, number 19 Mayera Street, Navi Plaza, opposite Zitka Model Schools, Narai High Cost, Barnawa. Telephone numbers 0703-456-8035 or 0805-845-5719. Email preciousteam at yahoo.com. Website www.theplaceofrefuge.org. May your heart find help as you listen in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Amen. We just want to thank God again for granting us opportunity to sit together in our various groups as we did. Like we did say, this is not for professional workshops. This year, God helped us. And I'm sure that we had no time to discuss Practical, practical issues as it pertains to our various vocations, our various professions, our various places of labor, our offices, or whichever state of life that you have found yourself in. It is God's own hope of perpetuating what He's doing in our lives in this meeting and beyond. Like we did say, you meet people in the ordinary state of life, in their offices, in their homes, and in other places apart from the church. When we come for meetings like this, there are several people that will never be part of this meeting. No matter how much you try to invite them, somehow, somehow, they will not be here. And the only place where you can meet them is in their workplaces. It is there that they are ordinary. It is there that they are themselves. It is there that they are able to, to, to express their problems. You will see them in their natural state. And it is there that we have, that we have opportunity to affect them to touch them, to win them over for Christ. We recognize that even the revival that we are praying for, if God will not carry it beyond the hall, beyond this tent, it means that the effort of God has been in vain. We are looking for a revival that will lead to transformation. None of us here is happy about the state of things with the church and in our various workplaces. And like we said in the introduction, it looks as if the people at the other side, the children of darkness, they seem to be perpetuating and multiplying their own kind. We are watching them gradually taking over. We are watching evil multiplying in our midst. And it looks as if we are so helpless to do anything about it. There's so much religious from fear. But when it comes to the Christ that we profess being seen in our national life, in the market, in the hospital, in several places where people live their normal life, we see that it's not like that. We don't see it yet. I used to be bothered that when you go to Europe, you go to America, you go outside the shores of our nation, I discover that these people, they don't profess God the way we do. They may have their own peculiar problems, but they seem to have achieved what we have not achieved. 
in their society. Integrity is the watchword. Word. They are not going to church, but they will not cheat you. They are not going to church, but they are not as corrupt and as wicked as we are. They are not going to church, but when you marry the thing, it will be given to you. But here we are, full of all my prayers and several religious activities. And we are asking, why is it that despite all these things, we are not seeing again the effect in the society? So the burden of this workshop is that we carry all that God is doing, all that God has said, all that God has instructed you back to your own place of deployment. As we went around and we saw the practicality of the discussions that were going on, it was a joy to our heart. And several issues were raised, and thank God that there was time to give answers to them. In the next 28 minutes or so, we'll just be taking few questions that are here as it pertains to us and we will tidy up in prayers and trust God that God himself will launch us forth in Jesus' name. Let me read the question to myself before I read it out. Right, the first question says, what can we say of a father who abandons his family when they were children and they were very young and now he's trying to attach himself with only the children because he's married to another woman so he hates their mother and calls her wicked and demands responsive and demands responsibility for his misfortune or so should the children accept him that is only the picking his calls at least so, I don't know why this question is coming I'm trying to see its real relevance to the issue that we are talking about laboring for revival in our workplaces I guess that since we have several groups maybe this is coming from a student and so they are in their own world. For me to think it's not relevant, I think it's an issue. The only thing I want to say quickly is that no matter what any man has done, no matter what our father has done, no matter what our mother has done, because we want, because our heart burden is that we are praying for revival. We are praying for conversion of men. We are desirous that Jesus will use us to bring many sons into glory. Isn't it? So, in this case, forgiving our father, forgiving our parent for the wrong that he has done seems to be the most appropriate step to take because your target at the end of the day is how to win your father over to the kingdom. So, we are not, at this point in time, a, a man who is praying for revival does not count wrongs. The heart and the burden that God has given us now is a time to forgive. If forgiving any person will draw the person into the kingdom, I think it's the simplest thing that we should be able to do. After all, the Bible said concerning Jesus, why were you sinners? What did he do? He died for us. And so my answer to the person that sent this question is, accept your father, forgive him. Go beyond picking his calls. Embrace him. Show him the love of God. Jesus Christ was the one who said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. I discover that people don't know what they are doing. It doesn't matter his age. It doesn't matter whether he's beating his hand on his chest and he's saying, I know what I'm doing. 
people don't know what they are doing. And if we believe Jesus Christ, let's act like him. Somebody is asking about wearing of trouser. I'm quoting Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. If there's people are wearing trousers in her profession, you know, what does she do? Maybe you are an NYSC member or so. What is my response? Again, my response is that that is not the thing troubling God, first and foremost. The revival, if it's in the NYSC, is not first and foremost eradicating the wearing of trousers. The first thing that God will want to do is to convert the heart of men. And when the heart of a man is converted, somehow it will show in the person's outlook. But we already have some of these things already institutionalized. And we don't have the way we done, so to say, to change it. One thing I've told our sisters, I said, when you go to your house, where the onus is on you to determine what you will wear, wear what is correct. It is when I see you wearing what your heart is in conflict with, when it lies within you to do so, that I think there's a matter. But when it comes to NYSE, and maybe we don't have the way with her to change it, even though we have said that God's problem and the major issue and what will bring revival is not first and foremost changing the dressing of core members. I assume this is a core member because he's talking about wearing trousers, being made compulsory in maybe her place of work. So, wear them. If that is the only thing, or if that is the option. And sometimes, some people have gone out of their way to resolve some of these clothings and become, make them become revealing. But if it is the ordinary one that is sold, NYSE uniform, please wear them. If you couldn't change them. And rather concentrate your heart on praying for the conversion of the heart of men. God will resolve this. We don't want to talk more about trousers. The last question, most hand works require the help of mechanics or machine devices and tools for its execution. These machines are very expensive that most of us can hardly buy it. So since the business belongs to God, what should we do to secure these machines and also improve on today's knowledge of oppression as required as required or services for our customers and God. I'm trying to picture what he's writing. That the, this person must belong to the artisan group and he's saying by virtue of their work they require or they use machines that are expensive and he's saying what can they do to acquire these machines uh, knowing that the knowledge of this use of these modern machines will uh, you know, uh, enhance their operations. I would have referred this question back to the workshop group for the leader to bring answers to them. But again, on a general note, Bible said, despise not the days of small beginning. And everything in the kingdom of God starts as a mustard seed. So I want to say that the one that God has provided, let's be using it, let's be praying, and let's be trusting God that He will provide. It is God that will determine how we will move from one level of our business to other. But let's not forget that the, we are not even at work to first and foremost use expensive machines and produce great outputs or great products. The burden and trust of the workshop is how God will use you to affect your professional colleagues. So if what God has provided 
limits you to a certain circumference, a certain number of people, a certain caliber of people. Those are the people that God will have you focus on. And he will help us in Jesus' name. Alright, I will quickly run through these questions because our time is going. At my workplace, I did a work that favored a colleague and he was happy. And later he sent a little package to me as an appreciation, not really a bribe. I collected and used the money given to me to affect lives. That is somebody. Am I wrong in collecting the envelope of appreciation? Praise the Lord. You know, I was going to say that if your conscience condemns you, the scripture said, then you are not right with God. So if what has happened here is the details of actually what happened, then we will say that if you did the work, you said you did it for your colleague, and he was happy, and he sent you a little package, and you took it. We normally say that we should avoid taking gifts, bribes, gratifications, especially when it is going to impair your judgment, when it is going to affect you taking a stand and doing what is righteous when it is time to do it. If all that happened is in the context of what you have spoken, that you did a job, we don't know the details of the job, for a professional colleague, you know. And at the end of the day, the person said, you know, take this. I don't know whether it is something, are you supposed to do it free of charge? You didn't tell us. Has he paid you what was your real entitlement? And this is an additional thing. We don't know. But if we did it, you did a job for any person, and the person is coming to say, take something from my heart, and it's actually from the person's heart, and you yourself have prayed, and the Holy Spirit is giving you liberty. Sometimes, if you are not sure, you can suspend taking the action and consult, and share with your brethren, share with the spiritual oversight over you. There is nothing wrong with that, and get a better counsel, depending on the details of this. Supposing we are going to be talking with this person, we would have been asking no questions so that we can actually find the context on which this gift was given. So, whoever wrote this question, if you still need definite counsel, please, you can meet the leadership of this meeting and God will help. This is the last one we'll be taking. I'm a farmer, for instance, and after harvest, I calculated all that I spent and fixed a price for my grain, the bag. All of a sudden, the price for the same grain has shot up in the market. Is it proper to sell the same with the market price or sell it at the price I earlier fixed, lower than the market price? Praise the Lord. You know, even if you ask Jesus this question, he will not answer yes or no. <laughs> but you see, what I want to say is that there's a heart for revival that will lead you on what to do. There's a heart that you carry that is wanting to use every opportunity to strike men for Jesus that will determine actually what you will do here. If you don't have that heart, then you'll be talking about whether to lower the price or not. If you discover that lowering the price will distinguish your own store as a store that is different from the store of others, no man can buy to, and they will see clearly this man is selling this thing at this lower price because 
he is carrying the life of Christ. And that action will end up bringing somebody to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Why not lower your price? Do you know that if all that Jesus requires you, if you want to win disciples for Jesus, is for you to lower your price. And even suffer loss will it be too much. So it depends on the cry of your heart. The Lord will help us. As we tidy up, we started looking at, please, some other questions that are here. God will help us. I can't treat every one of them. Uh, but please, if you submitted any question and you still needed desperately an answer, you can please meet again the leadership of the meeting after we tidy up this roundup and then we can take it. We're looking at laboring for revival in our workplaces. And we saw clearly that God's plan is not for Christ's life to be limited to the religious environment of a church setting, of a meeting such as we are having here now. We want to thank God for the visitation of God in our lives in course of this meeting. And God has spoken to us. God has touched us. We have been ushered into an atmosphere of prayer. And me personally, I exercise my spirit and prayed. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling revived. I'm feeling challenged. But despite my feeling, despite whatever thing that I think I've got in this meeting, if it does not translate to the conversion and transformation of lives outside here particularly, then there's no need for us, for God to have done what he did all these days. And we are sure that the only way that revival will be perpetrated, lives will be touched, is if we carry the life of Christ back to what our various offices, our various places where we spend the greater part of the day. It can be a hospital, it can be a church, it can be a school, it can be in the barrack, it can be in the market, it can be anywhere. Whatever you are doing, you know, and you discover that you spend the greater part of your day there, and you have people that belong to the same vocation with you, your contemporaries, this workshop is aimed at whatever God is doing in your life, affecting them. But beyond that, we want to go with a commission, a deliberateness, that look, we want Jesus to take over wherever God has positioned me. We want to pursue it as a deliberate thing. We discover that if we don't deliberately pursue it, living a good life alone will not bring the revival we are praying for. Just being satisfied that people know that I'm a Christian and it ends there and we are not pursuing to establish the counsel of Jesus in our workplace. Nothing will happen. We will only assemble here again if the Lord tarries next year again to begin to pray and God will be speaking to us in the manner he did again, if he will. So, we said that there is a basic understanding that we need to have. That basic understanding is that God is the owner of your life. That God owns everything you have. Is the understanding of divine ownership. That by creation, God is the one who created us. Is there anybody who created himself? No. By redemption, we are God's property. And redemption is not only the fact that God is the one who made you to be born again, who paid the price and saved you from your sins. We are used to look at redemption 
to include physical redemption. Is there anybody here that God has ever redeemed from a ghastly motor accident? You have survived accident before. Is there anybody here that you were terribly sick and every hope was that you were going to die? But suddenly, and by the mercy of God, you find yourself alive. If you can testify to the physical deliverance of God, it is an indicator that he left you alive for a purpose. And that purpose is for his pleasure. Two times in my own life, I have survived an accident. And each time I came out from such accident, one understanding, one thing God keeps whispering to my heart is that I saved you for a purpose. If there was no reason, if there was no pleasure that I intended to derive from your life, you would have gone. There was one that it was like a, 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 a twinkle of an eye. I was at the back of the vehicle to my left. Not only did the woman die, but I watched how the glass chopped off almost half of her hair, neck. I looked to my right, the person gone. I was flung to the middle seat. And it was in the night. Yet, this is how I came out. And I said, God. God said, yes. By redemption, you are mine. And if God has done that to you, I want to ask you again, what is God gaining that he didn't allow you to die? There are several people that even though God has done so raw physical deliverance, there is nothing that heaven is rejoicing about that they did what they did. There are some people that even their physical health is a trouble to heaven. Heaven is more at peace when they are sick. Every position that we occupy in life, we are occupying it for God. And the scriptures we read pointed out clearly that truly speaking, promotion does not come from the east or west. Promotion comes from God. It is God that places one man on a throne and removes another. So wherever you find yourself today, may I declare to you again that you didn't come there by merit. Even when it is an uncle that you made a phone call to, that seemingly put you there. If God did not allow it, it will not come to pass. I hope you know it. But sometimes God, anticipating what he wants to do with you in future, allows some things to happen. Every possession in our control, who is the owner of it, is God. There is nothing like my car, my house, my job, my children. Every of those things that we are saying, my, 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 my. Actually speaking, from the discussions that we had in our workshop today, did God give us understanding that it is not yours? It is God's. Except we have this understanding, when it comes to a shield of another, when you have come to know that you are not the owner of your life, you are not the owner of the job that you find yourself doing, you didn't bring yourself there, God saved you for a purpose, and you are only there for his pleasure. And that if your life is not giving him pleasure there, you have no business being in that place. Then you will be able to settle down and pursue revival. God has helped us to practically discuss pursuit of the revival in our various workplaces. But we want to pray on opportunities. Opportunities in our workplaces. There are several opportunities that are bound. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46. We are not going to read it for want of time. But you know that story. You know the story? I was sick. You didn't visit me. 
I was in prison. I was naked. And all of those things that transpired there. But God wants to open our eyes to see opportunities that are bound in our various workplaces. I'm a military man and I've discovered that it is one of the best things that can happen to you. People feel that military puts you at a disadvantage. But I have seen that it is the best profession because it, it places you with every advantage. Do you know that even though people are afraid to enter vehicles that they don't know, if somebody is waiting for lift and is standing by the roadside rolling down a vehicle, if he looks at the driver and the person that stops is in military uniform, what happens to the person who wants to enter? If they are offering you lift, your confidence say, I am secure. I gave somebody lift one time and I decided to crack a joke. I said, you have just entered into the hand of kidnappers. <laughs> and then the person said, sir, <laughs> it's not possible. I said, why do you say it's not possible? He said, it's not possible. Anyway, quickly, before time will be go past and I will drop the person. We have to quickly strike. Strike means you are quickly sharing the word of God before you get to the place where you will drop the person. That is what that car was given to you for. You cannot have a vehicle. And what is bothering me is that my shock absorber is bad. I don't carry more than three people at the back. your car. And you are saying, no, 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 no. Don't date in my car. It's because you think it's your own. Everything at your disposal. Are you a teacher? How can you have students that are given to us from morning to afternoon? Parents are coming to join them. And they are saying, take this child until 2 o'clock. I am giving you 6 hours, 7 hours, to spend with my child. I will come and collect him back. What an opportunity to do a, a strike and affect the life of these children. Not first and foremost by preaching the gospel, but by getting involved in the troubles of their life. By using academics, as a platform to win the heart of that child. There's a scripture that touches me whenever I'm relating with these children. The Bible says, it says, I have become all things to all men so that I win them to Christ. To a child, I have become a child so that I can win him for Christ. So whatever is the understanding of a child about what Christ ought to be, a teacher is descending to the level of that child. If his problem is indices and log readings, and you are the teacher that helped him to understand that, they will never forget you. And we can go on, get to the medical profession. God has given us opportunity to be the person. The people that meet those who are on their way to eternity. And no matter how good people are, when they are their sick bed, they become the most humble people. Those who say, I don't want to hear the gospel, they become sober. And they are ready to receive the gospel from the hand of someone they hated to drove away. And how can you be there? And you didn't have this understanding. You are quarreling with the fact that they, they are placing you on duty too much. They say there's an emergency and you switch off your phone. I used to have a doctor who is our colleague. 
He brags with the fact that they say, Car, the doctor, you know, they pick phone call. I say, Ah, uh -uh, doctor, no matter how much you call him in the night, he will not pick his call. He said, That's my policy. Actually, that's my policy. I said, oh, Be careful with this, your policy. Because even if you don't have a heart for God, the day they want to call you for something good, you have switched off your phone. But a man that has a heart that I am in this profession to, to, to touch men for Jesus, you have already seen the medical profession as a place to help men, not just with their physical sickness, but with their spiritual sickness. I'd like to tidy up with just a story. I had a senior colleague who never wanted to hear the gospel and who gave us all manner of names because he thought we were zealous for Jesus. And on his sick bed, God gave us opportunity to meet with him. I remember vividly, I met him at the hospital and he was, at the time I met him, he was already almost gone. He couldn't talk out audibly. He can open his mouth, he can hear, but he couldn't utter out anything anybody can hear. So I said, sir, you know, are you ready to receive Jesus now? Are you ready to receive Jesus? He nodded his head. I said, sir, are you sure? Don't do it to make me happy. He said, I said, okay, sir, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I come to you today. Forgive me my sins. We did that horribly. And I said, sir, please wait. Let me go and bring my cassette so that I can come and put a message for you. Even though you can't talk, you'll be listening to a message. By the time I went to bring the cassette and return back, he was gone. So we don't meet people by chance. That everything you have at your disposal is to strike me for Jesus. We don't want to miss our chances again. I have missed my own chances. I have had the opportunity that I met a colleague. We shouted and we greeted ourselves. And we healed ourselves. And we greeted and showed me his wife and his new car. I went to my workstation. No, less than one week after, there was a test message. All you colleagues of this man contribute money for his burial on so so date. I said, What? We just meet. And God said, Yes. I brought him across your path seven days to his death. Thinking that you'll be sensitive enough to strike. He showed you his car. He showed you his new life. You missed that chance. And such cries of lost opportunities abound in our hearts. As we pray again now, I'd like to beg us again. What will you go and do after here? What is the burden of your heart? What impact are you going to break to pray in that place where God has placed you? Let's bow our hearts and pray. Can you just speak to God again? It's been a long session, we know. But this is the hope of this revival. I like us to pray a prayer that I say, Lord, I see men as this. Open my eyes to see men as souls. Open my eyes, Lord, to see men as souls. Sometimes you see their money. You see their intelligence. You see their academic prowess. But you don't see them as a soul. They can be here today, they will vanish tomorrow. You are that man. You are that woman that God has positioned as a last resort on his journey to eternity.
let's beg God to help us to strike when opportunity comes. We are going to strike. Every opportunity that God brings, we will not waste it again. We have wasted so much opportunity. But we want to strike. Let's ask God for boldness. Boldness, God deliver me from the fear of opposition. Fear of the Holy Spirit. Let not the threat of human beings mean anything to me, Lord. That I may take my stand, Lord, in the place where you have planted me. For further inquiries on this and other messages, please contact Refuge Media, number 19 Mayera Street, Navi Plaza, opposite Zedka Model Schools, Narai High Cost, Barnawa. Telephone numbers 0703 456 8035 or 0805 845 5719. Email Precious team at yahoo.com Website www.theplaceofrefuge.org May your heart find help as you listen in Jesus' name.